Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Erica, they let us out of the studio, but not too far, as we're in Bloomington, the gateway to scenic southern Indiana. And home of the Hoosiers. Join us tonight to learn how limestone shaped this city and the nation. Discover the eclectic home of Garrett Antiques and relax at one of the city's newest breweries. There's more than meets the eye in this college town. It's all coming up right now on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special. I'm Erica Sagone. And I'm Daryl Neer. Now, Erica, can we really call this a tank trip? <laughs> it's true. This is our hometown, but whether you're visiting Bloomington for an afternoon or you live here like us, I guarantee you're going to learn some things about the city on this show. And what better place to start than the building behind us, the iconic Monroe County Courthouse. It's beautiful on the inside and the construction is just wonderful limestone. But did you know that there are famous structures and buildings all over the country that are built with limestone that came from right here in Monroe County? Let's take a look. For over 200 years, limestone from the hills of southern Indiana has changed the face of American architecture. A little history of Indiana limestone to start with is that the deposit, which stretches about 67 miles from the northwest to the southeast through south central Indiana, is a sedimentary deposit of sea creatures. So over 300 million years old, and it's a really vast and, and uniform deposit, which is what makes it unique. The uh, Indiana region, the stone here was really exposed when the ice flows moved down, you know, millions of years ago, stopped in around Martinsville, and all of that water and, and melting came down and, and exposed a lot of the stone, which made it accessible. Limestone became a popular building material for Indiana's earliest pioneers. By 1827, Richard Gilbert established the state's first organized quarry located near Steinsville, about 14 miles from Bloomington. The quarry provided limestone for many local projects, including the Tippecanoe and Vigo County courthouses. So around the early 1800s, you had people starting to settle in this area. A lot of the stone that they pulled it initially was for cabin sills and steps and, and you know, uh, basic uh, building blocks that they used uh, early on. Since that time, uh, the demand for Indiana limestone became very prevalent. Uh, 1850s, they started moving a lot of rail systems down in, into the belt. The industry doubled and then redoubled again between around 1890 and 1910 when you had the advent of a lot of urban building. So building codes changed and the use of more uh, fire resilient building materials became uh, more of a demand. And fortunately for our industry, the early founders realized that and uh, the demand for the stone just kept increasing and increasing. As architectural demand for limestone grew, Indiana companies responded. Between 1889 and 1895, the number of quarries doubled. By 1900, Indiana limestone represented a third of the nation's limestone industry, with over 50 companies represented in southern Indiana. A lot of what really helped, I think, bolster the industry was there was a lot of immigration going on. Yeah, the Italians obviously have a tremendous resource of experienced carvers. Uh, there were folks coming in from Ireland and Scotland that also had good experience working with stone. You know, stone is really the, the primary building uh, material universally. And, and so every region has its experts in, in stone carving and, and cutting and those kinds of techniques, uh, especially in, in European communities. And so they have a history of, of those expertise. So when they came over here to look for a, a different life or a better life, 
obviously brought with them a lot of their skills and, and trade. With the influx of skilled labor and productivity, demand for Indiana limestone skyrocketed. By 1920, Indiana's production represented 80% of the nation's output. Noted for its superior weather resistance and quality, Indiana limestone became the favored building block for the nation's most iconic 20th century projects. You know, we have a lot of notable uh, projects that, you know, historically we can point to and, and most people know what they are. Uh, the Empire State Building is built with Indiana limestone. The Pentagon, you know, another project back in the day built in 40 to about 41 over about 16 months. You know, for decades that's been the largest uh, office building in the world. Also, the U.S. National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Uh, is entirely clay with Indiana limestone. That project spans a fifth of a mile, I believe. So, you know, there's been a lot of really neat projects built with the stone. Throughout the 20th and 21st century, Indiana limestone remained a favorite building material across the nation. Today, there are nine active quarries in southern Indiana, with nearly 2.7 million cubic feet of Indiana limestone quarried each year. One reason for its continued popularity is its reputation for versatility. Indiana limestone is a freestone, which means that it has no preferential direction of splitting. This allows the stone to be planed, turned on a lathe, and even handcrafted, making it a perfect choice for architects and artisans alike. There's a, a sculptor here locally in Bloomington, Amy Breyer, who has uh, done works all over the country. And she trained in Italy. She trained with a lot of master carvers, and now she is a master carver. Uh, she's done a, a, a great deal of public works around uh, Bloomington and elsewhere. Uh, at the psych building at IU, there's a big sculpture of a brain. Amy carved that, and it's an anatomically correct rendition of a brain. Artists like Amy, who create and design and sculpt as well, and, and start from the ground up with those works, they come and they work with Indiana Limestone, and they're like, wow, this is like carving in butter. In Bloomington in particular, I think it's extremely important to us as a community to continue uh, building with Indiana Limestone. As much as people may not recognize it sometimes, uh, that's what Bloomington is known for. Indiana Limestone and, and IU really grew up together, and they grew this town together. Indiana Limestone is truly the foundation of this community, along with IU and these other companies. It, it promotes our industry, it promotes our community, and, our, and it promotes our sense of community as well. To learn more about Monroe County's history, go to monroehistory.org. You know, limestone from this region can be found in art and buildings all across Bloomington. Like this piece that's right behind us, it's called the Bloomington Banquet Sculpture, and it sits on the B-Line, which is the three-mile walking and biking trail that cuts right through the center of the city. You know, Eric, if we go about a block and a half down the trail, we'll see one of Bloomington's most historic and unique houses, currently home to Garrett Antiques. Let's take a look. Just off the Courthouse Square in downtown Bloomington looms a turreted mansion carved in imposing Indiana limestone. Today, it is home to one of the state's oldest antique shops, the Garrett, known for its rare and often unusual collection, fitting for this eclectic home with a storied past. The mansion was commissioned in the late 1890s by one of the pioneer citizens of Bloomington, John Waldron Sr. Waldron came to Bloomington in 1856 after purchasing a tannery and investing the profits into real estate. By the turn of the century, Waldron owned much of the property on the Courthouse Square, including several magnificent mansions along Kirkwood Avenue. This particular residence, however, was designed as a wedding gift for the union of Waldron's daughter Mary to the esteemed Bloomington attorney Ira C. Batman, forever bestowing the title The Batman House on the residence. The eccentric design was crafted by one of Bloomington's first professional architects, John L. Nichols, shortly after he set up his business in August of 1895. Nichols went on to achieve great success, designing many of the most prominent downtown Bloomington structures. But the Batman residence remained one of his most renowned works. 
1929, the residence was sold to proprietor E.T. Ware and his wife, Grace, and the family took a full ad in the local Bloomington newspaper to announce the mansion's new mission, not as a residence, but as the Ware funeral home. For reasons unknown, the venture was short-lived. By the early 1930s, the property was purchased by the Laborers International Union, and for the next 40 years, the Batman House functioned as its headquarters. Until 1974, when a chance sighting by the Garrett family led to an eclectic match made in heaven. We had been in business since 1964. Started our first antique shop on North Walnut Street. And one day we saw a sign in the window. It wasn't even in the hands of a realtor, just a for sale sign in the front window. <laughs> for sale. And we said, oh, we gotta, we gotta buy that house. <laughs> so we did. For a limestone house, it's one of the most interesting ones, I think, in town with the towers and so forth. Everybody comments on them. We bought it then in 74, and we worked on it for a long time inside and out because the roof was leaking. We had to have a new roof put on. Took care of the plaster and painted every room in the house. <laughs> so it was two years before we actually opened our shop here. In addition to the fine china and extravagant furniture, the shop features an extensive collection of rocks and minerals, a lifelong passion of Mr. Garrett that started as a child. He told me a story one time about a cousin of his giving him a, a geode that was all rough and about the size of an egg, and he told him it was a, snake's, a snake egg. <laughs> and that fascinated him so, I mean, it was just a geode, and that fascinated him so that he started collecting rocks. I mean, I was never interested in that sort of thing until I met him, but you know, it rubs off on you. <laughs> and you go to shows and you see things from all over the world. I think he just liked to find things that were unusual that he hadn't seen before, you know. And that love of the strange extended to his own private collection of oddities. Not for sale to the mansion visitors, but widely known for such items as monkey skeletons, mummies, and even an octopus preserved in a jar. Talk about strange, yeah, we did have a blowfish, uh, and we had a, a taxidermied a cobra and mongoose. You like to have something that nobody else had, I guess. <laughs> or that you wouldn't see anyplace else. And I have had customers come in and say, you have the most interesting things and your place is more like a museum than it is a shop. In 2006, Dennis passed away but Nancy still strives to keep his spirit alive in the shop today. It's, it's fun to find all the interesting pieces, old pieces, really old pieces that were, you don't even see them in the antique shops these days. But some of the craftsmanship of the older wood, wood, wooden pieces and even the glass in China, some of it is just, you just do not see it anymore. And um, then for me too, one of the, Pleasures, we, we, we specialize in replacement parts for lighting. We have a lot of lights and we have chimneys and shades and so forth. People have an heirloom maybe that's been handed down in the family and then they, something gets broke on it and they ha can't use it or it needs rewiring or something if it's an electric lamp even. And if they bring it to us what they need or they can tell us what they need, then I can sell them the parts to make it whole again. It makes me feel good because it makes them feel good that now that something that was passed down to them is usable again. <laughs> so it makes me feel great. <laughs> Just as the Garretts assured that the Batman house was made usable again and will pass on for generations to come. For hours and directions to this shop, visit the Garrett Antiques Facebook page. Daryl, exploring Bloomington by foot is so much fun because this is really an incredibly walkable city. It really is, but after all of that walking, you may want to grab a drink. And, and people know about Bloomington Brewing Company in Upland, but one of the new kids on the block is Function Brewing. And Function is literally right off the busy downtown square, so let's head inside and check it out. Hello, Arlen. Hey, guys. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming. 
Well, Arlen, we're accustomed to coming into to Function Brewing, and uh, we really don't know the story. I was wondering, could you give us some background on how you and Steve came up with the, the concept of Function? Oh, yeah, my husband Steve, who's the brewer, and, um, and I wanted to have a real small batch brewery um, because he wanted to sort of do a sort of experimental beer, and I wanted to be able to make food that would sort of fulfill me, and uh, we came up with the idea, of, like the name and the brand, based on the idea that what you put into something has an impact on what you get out of it. So that variable aspect um, of a function that you can plug a different variable in and run it through, that idea that we can play around and have fun and experiment with different flavors and styles and um, sort of the driving force. Oh, and Steve started brewing in, what, 2006 doing home brewery. Right. Um, how did you make that choice? Hey, it makes sense to jump from the home, being a home brewer into a, a full-fledged brewing company. Yeah, well, he had been doing that for years and really just enjoying it. It had become more than just a casual hobby. Like, he uh, was brewing so much, he, we couldn't drink it. We were giving it away to friends and family constantly. And we were in that place of trying to figure out what we wanted to do that would allow us to work together and work for ourselves. And um, Steve was on a newsletter for a brewery who happened to mention that they were um, upsizing to a newer system and he emailed them and asked what are you doing with the old system and the owner brewer said I don't really have a plan for it so it was out in Idaho and we um, very fortuitously had a trip planned um, just a few weeks later so we uh, managed to meet up with her and met her and saw the system and um, just decided that why not why not now you know like we can keep talking about this for years or we can just jump in and make an effort and, and talk a little bit about um, the types of beers that Steve and you have put together on, on the menu. Yeah, I mean, he tries to really approach it like a chef and um, pull interesting ingredients together, things that work and or sometimes things that you think will work and sort of challenging new flavors a lot of times. So we have four flagship beers that never change. So if someone walks in the door, they know for sure they can get a light beer, they can get a um, grain uh, forward beer, they can get a roasty beer, they can get a hoppy beer. But then he set those aside, those four, which are all really good, but then we also have eight um, experimental taps at any given time, and we try to offer a range within that. And he's done like a smoked blonde with, um, with orange peel, he's done a Mayan chocolate stout, uh, he's done lots of different things It's just sort of like strike his fancy. Any sense of how many beers that you've served on tap here at Function? I think we've had over a couple hundred unique beers, um, so he's always trying to do something new. So you really are a true microbrewery. Yeah, um, I think we're technically actually a nanobrewery. Um, we have like two barrels of, of uh, brewing and three barrels of fermentation. So uh, we're tiny and we and we just wanted to be a small neighborhood place that was able to take risks and uh, do different things and, and sort of be who we are and let people connect to us. We have all this huge international influence and um, benefits of this much larger global community that we're connected to, but we're also still kind of a small town and um, people recognize that and value that and um, we're just grateful to be a part of it. Well, Arlen, we're grateful that you're a part of Bloomington as well thank and, you so and much. what you're being able to offer us. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for coming by. Well, for more information on Function Brewing, visit their website, functionbrewing.com. Thanks again, Arlen. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Well, now we're going to head to another one of Bloomington's favorite places to relax and unwind, Lake Monroe. You may know it as the largest lake in the state, but did you know that there's a secret at the bottom? Let's take a look. Elkinsville, it's known as the town that once was. Founded in 1817 by pioneer William Elkins, the historic village sat nestled in the hills and valleys of the Salt Creek watershed, a fertile bottomland perfect for southern Indiana's first farming families. By 1950, Elkinsville was small, but a burgeoning community, home to 100 close-knit residents. Within the decade, however, only traces of Elkinsville would remain an old cemetery, a handful of abandoned houses, and a bittersweet tale of the town's forced decay. As the neighboring city of Bloomington continued to expand in population, so too did the need for suitable water sources. In addition, disastrous floods across the area prompted renewed demand for flood control from the White River and its tributaries. In 1958, having stressed all other options, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers announced a new project, a dam to be built on Salt Creek and a resulting reservoir, Lake Monroe. 
When completed, Lake Monroe would be the largest lake entirely situated in Indiana. With almost 11,000 acres of water surface area, enough to satisfy the needs of Monroe County's growing population. The lake would also save over 430,000 acres of land from the threat of flooding. But its creation would come at more than just a monetary price. Several communities, including Elkinsville, would need to be relocated. In 1959, the Army Corps of Engineers, with the help of local government, would begin the process of removing the residents. They were talking about flood control as well as water resource. Early people that came through, the big corporations came through and took all the trees. And so whenever they took the trees away, it caused flooding. When that flooding got really bad, it would take and flood part of the towns. And uh, that was their justification for using eminent domain. Of course, there was a lot of politics involved as well because as we know people land down near Monroe County and Bloomington people were allowed to keep their land up here at Elkinsville the people's land was taken away from them with the threat of eminent domain and yet people within 300 meters of the lake are still have houses all of the places where they came through, they all got a short end of the stick. They purchased the land for less than $100 an acre and said, you got to move along. After they were chased out for Lake Monroe from about in the early 60s, it left a bitter taste in many people's mouth and in their mind and in their heart. And it took them a while to get over that. By the reservoir's completion in 1964, more than 300 homes, along with three schools, 10 churches, and eight cemeteries, were either relocated or simply washed away. However, after the lake was filled and opened to the public, it was discovered by former residents that the majority of Elkinsville remained untouched by the waters of Lake Monroe. Within a few years, a handful of dedicated residents returned to the area once more. One such person was Bill Miller, he was drawn to the Elkinsville area for its wild landscapes and prevailing solitude. Soon, however, the history of the town became just as alluring. I purchased this property uh, down here in 1967, so I will have had property here for 50 years this year. I kept looking around after we got the property, where are the people that used to live here? And I kept wanting to meet them so I could learn about the history and years passed and I didn't meet any of them or very few. And then finally one day, the local people that used to live here would like to have a place for a reunion. Can you suggest any place they could have it? And I said, sure, they can have it here at my property because I'm really interested in the history. It got the people to come back and not focus on what happened to them but to focus on the good community that they had and the fun, and they focused on the positive. So instead of leaving a bitter taste in their mind, it erased that to a large degree and helped make good memories of Elkinsville. But the reunion has uh, started out about 250 to 300 people in 1987. And so over the years now it's dwindled down as those people aged and passed on that we still have around 80 to 100 people. So this year will be the 30th reunion. But the story of Elkinsville isn't just for returning locals. The majority of what remains of Elkinsville lies within state and federally protected land. The surrounding wilderness is a hot spot for outdoor recreation, such as hiking and canoeing so visitors can traverse the remnants of Elkinsville and experience its history for themselves. There's about 50,000 acres contiguous with Elkinsville, so there's about three or four different entities of public lands that come together here. I think the story of Elkinsville is one that people can use to say that people took a bad situation and moved on. We all have to deal with adversity in our lives. The idea of preservation and keeping things going 
It's uh, important because the Elkinsville community is uh, one that should be preserved for the future generations. While Elkinsville may be known as the town that was, it is evident that the spirit of the town still continues as a vibrant reminder of the sacrifice made for those who find solace on the Lake Monroe shores and respite among the hills of this once historic town. For more information on how to visit Lake Monroe, go to in.gov. And for ideas on other places to visit in Bloomington, go to visitbloomington.com. Erica, no matter how long I call Bloomington home, I will never tire of exploring this community. Yeah, we are proud to call it home, and we're so glad you could join us on exploring this beautiful college town. Have a great night. Good night. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 